Hello, my name is Olaf Weil, and I feel really privileged to be able to present this talk on the importance of respecting culture, practicing inclusivity, and enabling participation when leading diverse teams in Southern Africa. Let me introduce myself. I was born in Gießen, Germany in 1972. In 1977, my parents moved to Africa as development workers. In 1998, I obtained a PhD from Rhodes University in South Africa. And later the same year, I was appointed as fisheries research advisor to the Malawi Department of Fisheries. In 1999, I married Michelle and we have twin girls. And in 2003, after the end of the Malawi project, I returned to Rhodes University as a postdoc. I was later employed there as senior lecturer, and in 2009, I joined the South African Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity as a senior scientist. At this institute, I received a South African Research Chair in Inland Fisheries and Freshwater Ecology in 2017, and in 2018, I became the chief scientist. At the South African Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity, our mission is to improve the quality of life of all South Africans through advancing aquatic research, science, technology, and innovation. The science component of the Institute comprises 14 researchers who through associations with South African universities are currently involved in the supervision of 30 PhD and 25 MSc students. We provide research platforms to the scientific community which include the maintenance of an acoustic tracking network, coastal craft, genetic laboratories, and we hold South Africa's national fish collection. The Institute's key performance indicators are research outputs measured by peer-reviewed papers and capacity development measured by student supervision. My own research interests are in the fields of inland fisheries, freshwater ecology, fish diversity, distributions, and resilience to global change, and on the consequences of alien species introductions. My awesome team comprises postdocs, PhD, masters, and honors students. So, a little more about myself. I grew up in Southern Africa. My father was a development worker for the Gesellschaft für Technische Zusammenarbeit, and when I was five years old, he relocated us to the small rural town of Kabompo in the northwestern province of Zambia, where he was the leader of an agricultural development project. My father was strong in emphasizing integration. Not only of us, even as children, we went to the local school, but also between professionals. And during my youth, I was privileged to interact with a variety of expatriate and local characters working in the rural development sphere, including advisors, consultants, social scientists, extension workers, nurses, priests, and university professors. I did not realize it then, but it was these interactions that later allowed me to better navigate the social and cultural complexities of the work environment and to develop a successful career. In the fisheries research environment, leadership positions often come with very little actual power over choosing your teams or making them work well together. Good performance is based on creativity and work hours are mostly determined by what it takes to get the job done rather than by some sort of contractual obligation. Commonly teams comprise individuals of different societal, cultural and employment backgrounds here, for example, one of my students is deploying a baited underwater video in Lake Nyasa together with technical staff from the Fisheries Research Institute in Mozambique. The best functioning teams are those whose members have developed mutual respect for each other, fostering a common desire to be productive and helpful team members. This is difficult to develop during typically short project cycles which are the norm rather than the exception in most fisheries programs. Successful implementation is therefore dependent on motivating people 
to perform and collaborate in social and environmental contexts that are often well outside their comfort zones. Key to this, I believe, is respecting culture, practicing inclusivity, and enabling participation. And I will now go into a couple of examples from my career to illustrate this. Shortly after completing my PhD, I was offered the position of Fisheries Research and Management Advisor to the Malawi Department of Fisheries by the, by the Gesellschaft für Technische Zusammenarbeit, the German Corporation Agency. Our project was called the National Aquatic Resource Management Program, or NAMAP. I was technically competent, having just finished a doctoral thesis that developed technical management recommendations for reservoir fishery in central Mozambique but I had little experience in managing research teams. This was confounded by the fact that most of the research staff that I was expected to advise had, had more experience than I did and had been working on different aspects of the fishery for decades. While their salaries were paid by the government, research activities were dependent on donor projects such as ours, and the placement of young professionals as advisors was and is a common practice in development circles. As a mid-career scientist, I always tried to think about what would happen if the roles were reversed and a 27-year-old PhD graduate, such as this one, was placed in my institution as an advisor on a condition of being awarded a research grant. Successful leadership in such situations requires taking time to engage with your colleagues to understand the societal and institutional culture, recognizing the skills and experience that people have to offer, sharing credit and adequately acknowledging contributions from all team members. Respecting the societal and institutional culture is a critical component of gaining the trust of your team. While the larger issues such as religion and politics are often obvious, it is important to pay attention to some of the finer details. In Malawi, for example, my colleagues were always impeccably dressed, both in the workplace and during fieldwork. Attire was treated in a more relaxed manner by visiting researchers and consultants. While this did not affect interactions with other scientists, it did once result in a rather awkward situation when a village headman referred to a high-ranking visiting aquaculture consultant as the boy and has his seat placed outside the discussion circle during village meetings. Although I thought that the situation was quite funny at the time, my colleagues later explained that the country had only recently discontinued a strict conservative dress code and that wearing shorts to meetings, especially in the village, was considered very disrespectful. I think that an important lesson here is to realize that naivete regarding culture can result in considerable embarrassment to you and your colleagues. First impressions count, and because your colleagues might be too polite to tell you directly, make sure that you ask them what personal behavior is expected of you. Practicing principles of inclusion is also important for managing scientific teams. Once broken, trust is hard, if not impossible, to regain. And the most common breach of trust is undervaluing research contributions when it comes to writing papers. This is particularly prevalent in the interaction between scientists, students, and technical staff. I'm surprised by how often initial contributors to ideas and data are not consulted or included in the writing phase of the research, and thus have no opportunity to make it onto the author list. That is not to say that the addition as an afterthought, for example, we've added you to the list, but don't really expect you to do much, is any better. Ensuring that all team members have the opportunity to participate in project outputs can be a strong motivator. In Malawi, one of my initial tasks was to update and improve the system of catch statistics. The country has one of the most complete time series of catch and effort data in small-scale fisheries, dating back to 1976. As a result of a spatially dispersed artisanal fishery, 
the collection of catch data was decentralized to the provincial level. Reporting was dated and most time series ended in the 1980s or 10 years before we got there. This situation severely constrained our ability to use these data for management. The root of the problem was that there were few incentives to compile data and technical staff felt that their contributions were not sufficiently valued. To address this problem, we revitalized the Malawi Fisheries Bulletin series, co-authored papers collaboratively with technical staff, and held a national symposium to present results. These relatively small actions allowed us to update the time series for Malawi's fisheries, and by the time our project ended in 2002, national catch data were current. Now let's fast forward to South Africa. At the South African Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity, has a strong emphasis on transforming the science sector by providing opportunities to students from historically disadvantaged backgrounds. This can be surprisingly challenging to achieve in the aquatic realm, despite several programs specifically designed to facilitate this process. Here, recognizing the need to provide opportunities for empowerment is important. Although South Africa is considered one of the most rich countries in Africa, the country struggles with high levels of unemployment and poverty, and the gap between the rich and the poor is one of the widest in the world. Less affluent students often do not have the privilege of growing up in a family with access to a swimming pool or a car, which are important prerequisites for learning how to swim or drive, and are definitely critical skills for field-based research in the aquatic sciences. Developing these skills is essential for developing student confidence and ensuring that students participate in field programs. Opportunities for such students are often constrained by potential supervisors shying away from students who require field assistance because their inclusion can be logistically difficult for field teams. For example, a supervisor might have to find a driver for every field excursion for a student who can't drive themselves or needs to find somebody who's capable of swimming if the student can't to join on that field trip. Recognizing this gap, we mainstreamed driving and swimming as core activities in our postgraduate school by employing a driving instructor, allocating vehicles for training and offering swimming lessons. We complemented these activities with courses in boat skipper qualification and first aid to empower students to fully engage in field research. This resulted in an increasingly representative student contingent at SIAB, better integration of students into research groups, and increased capacity development in the country. I believe that many of these future leaders might have followed different career paths had we not recognized the importance of empowerment through life skills development. So, in conclusion, if you want to motivate people to perform and collaborate in social and environmental contexts that are often well outside their comfort zones, make sure that you respect culture, practice inclusivity, and enable participation. At this moment, I would like to take the opportunity to thank my family, colleagues, students, friends, fishers, fishers and funders for their roles in my fun-filled and rewarding career. Thank you very much. Are there any questions?